I am Associate Professor in Employment Law at um, Aston University, where I'm also the Associate Pro Vice Chancellor International. Um, my background is in HR. So I started off my career um, a long time ago now uh, in Jaguar Land Rover, actually, moved to Avery that make weighing machines over in Smethwick. And I was head of HR there um, until about 24 years ago when I had my first child and I set up my own consultancy. And then I also started doing bits and pieces of academic work as well. And um, at the moment, it won't let me open up chat. So we're just going to try that again and see if it will. And it still won't. So we'll just stop sharing and then it will work the second time round. I don't ever understand why Zoom does it this way. Right. OK, so that's now beginning. Um, right. So I did want to open up chat because as I'm talking, um, if you've got any questions, either by all means, open up your microphone and talk to me, but do put your questions into chat as well. I will try and end before 1.30, and so there will be time for questions at the end. But it, if there's a question that occurs to you as we go, then let's just address it. So I have now got chat visible on my screen so we can do that. And what we're going to talk about today is underperforming employees. But I'm take everything from an employment law perspective. So of course, there's lots of good things that we should do when employees are underperforming. We should be getting along employees, side employees. We should be asking them what the problem is. We should be trying to solve the problem before we even start to think about disciplinary warnings or dismissal. But I'm not here today to talk about the soft things. I'm here today to talk about the law. And not only is the law the most fascinating bit of it anyway, but also when you're dealing with employees and you're starting to get into that area where potentially there could be a bit of conflict, it's really important to know the law because doing something wrong at the very start of the process could mean that if you then embark on a formal process, when you get to the end of it, you've actually done something unfair because when we unpick it, something was wrong at the start. And so what I'm going to do is I'm, I am going to talk about dismissal and I am going to talk about disciplinary warnings. And we have to get it right at the beginning so we've got it right at the end. So. Let's start at the end and let's talk about dismissal. Because when we are thinking of an employee who is underperforming and we're thinking, yeah, okay, we might want to be embarking on a disciplinary warning. What we should be thinking of is where might this end? And if it's going to end in a dismissal, then we need a fair reason and a fair procedure and the dismissal must be within the range of reasonable responses. Now let's just go to that last point, the range of reasonable responses, because I'm sure that if we started to share our stories of underperforming employees, I'm sure that we could all think of an example of someone who has got away with it for years. Somebody who everybody knows underperforms and you would never ask them to um, interact with a customer or you'd never ask them to lead a project or you'd never give them anything with a tight deadline. And somehow we would all go, yeah, yeah, we know that sort of person. And yet quite often nothing's done about it. So how can it be fair that in some organisations there is no tolerance whatsoever of that sort of underperformance and in other organisations they seem to be quite littered with these sorts of employees? Well, if we ever end up in a situation of dismissal and it all goes a bit sour and we end up with an unfair dismissal claim, it's going to go to the Employment Tribunal. And what the Employment Tribunal is going to say is, 
is the way that the employer has responded within a range of reasonable responses. And it might be we have exactly the same employee in front of us and one of you says, oh, come on, they just need a bit of encouragement. And the other says, sack them. And it doesn't necessarily mean that one is wrong. And this is really important that when we're thinking about how we deal with employees, we've got to be reasonable. And the word reasonable has a huge amount of subjectivity about it, but it's accepted that some people will be more harsh than others. Doesn't mean one person is necessarily wrong and another person is necessarily right. There is a range. And that's really important to remember when you are dealing with an underperforming employee. There isn't a right way of dealing with that employee. There are definitely wrong ways, but there is not one right answer. And so you have got to apply your judgment and you have got to accept that there is some subjectivity in this one. Now, if we are going to dismiss an employee, the law, the Employment Rights Act 1996, says that there are only five potentially fair reasons. Capability, conduct, a statutory ban. I think that says statutory ban there, doesn't it? It should say ban. And that's when you can't employ somebody in a job anymore because it would be illegal to do so, like employing somebody as a driver if they've lost their license. Redundancy, very separate topic and some other substantial reason, which we're not going to address today. Because when we're talking about the underperforming employee, we're either got an employee who's got a capability problem, or we've got a problem in conduct. Because why is the employee underperforming? Is it because they can't do the job? That's a capability issue. Is it that their health is preventing them from doing the job? They just haven't got the skills. They just don't get it. They haven't got the appropriate qualification. Or is it that the employee is totally capable of doing a really good job, but they won't do it? And that's a conduct issue. And so before we embark on applying the law, we need to step back and make that judgment. And that is going to be the soft skill bit, but I'm not really addressing this lunchtime, but it will be around that whole question of why is this problem occurring? And we've got to understand that to know the right route to go down. Now, I've already said that cases might end up in front of the employment tribunal and one thing that the employment tribunal has no tolerance for is a rush to dismiss so what the employment tribunal wants to see is you've tried to make it better and that's a really important thing to remember so why might a problem occur with capability well if we look at the definition of capability in the um, Employment Rights Act 1996, then it's defined in four sort of areas. First of all, does the individual have the skill to do the job? Secondly, do they have the aptitude? Thirdly, do they have the qualification? And fourthly, is there a, <clears throat> excuse me, a barrier that has occurred because of their health? Now, of course, you might say, well, I wouldn't have recruited somebody for a job if they didn't have the skill, the aptitude and the qualifications. Of course, health problems can occur at a later stage. Yeah, sure, but a job might have changed. And I think this is one of the things that we're definitely seeing during COVID. Loads of us at the moment are working from home. In fact, I would guess that most of us are probably sat at our homes at the moment that has inevitably created some change in jobs. Some organisations have grown exponentially, some organisations have really declined. And as a result of this, individual jobs have changed. 
And it might be that you're now asking your employees to do things that are new to them and they can't do it. And that might be that they don't have the skill. It might be that they just don't have the aptitude. So you, you may be saying that everything's got to be online now and employees just do not have the aptitude to use computers, the internet and all those good things. So it can be that as jobs evolve, capability problems occur. It also could be that you've promoted an employee into a job that on reflection, you should never have promoted them into. As employers, we have responsibility not to put employees into situations where they're going to fail. So if the problem has occurred because we've promoted someone out of their comfort zone or we've made a, a recruitment error in effect as an employer we've got to start off with the attitude of we've got to solve it if it can't be solved okay then we're into stage two but stage one is how are you going to solve it now, you may say qualifications. Well, I definitely wouldn't have recruited somebody if they didn't have the qualification to do the job. Yeah, sure. But there are jobs where you have to redo your qualifications. So if you take pilots and I'm going to talk to, about various cases today and one of them, one of the first ones I'm going to talk about is indeed about a pilot. If you take pilots, they have to go back into the simulator and um, land a plane and take off in the simulator. Um, I think it's about every six months. And if they crash the plane, and of course it's on a simulator, so it is not real, but if they crash the plane or they don't take off properly, then they have to do additional training before they can fly a real plane again. They can lose their qualifications. And there's lots of jobs where there is a requirement for CPD or there is a requirement to actually go and redo qualifications at certain times. So we might have recruited employees that have got the qualifications, they might lose them. And health, we're going to pick up in a bit because that brings a whole new load of problems. So we'll just hold the area of health in the air and come back to it in a bit. Now, conduct. This is when the employee won't do what you're asking them to do. But the question then is, why? There are some people in life that are just downright difficult and we all know them. And sometimes there are employees that just dig their heels in and don't want to do what they're being told to do. But most people want to go to work and do a good day's work. They might not want to do as good a day's work as you would like, but they're not out and out to be difficult. And so if an employee is digging their heels in and saying, no, I'm not going to do that, or you think they're deliberately underperforming, what is the underlying reason? And this is the time to get the employee in for a meeting and to just say, come on, tell me what's going on. And it might be that there's something going on in their personal life that is causing them a huge amount of difficulty. It might be that they're being bullied at work and they didn't know what to do about it. But before we start getting into any formal procedure, it's just that, come on, tell me. And if the employee says, no, 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 everything's fine, I've got nothing to tell you, then it's about being honest and saying, well, I'm not satisfied with your performance. And if you're telling me there's no reason for the underperformance, then I'm sorry, but we're going to be... Um, talking disciplinary warnings before long. And it's putting the employee on notice that this is going to be happening. So let's start looking at some cases, some, some real things that have come to the courts. And the first one that I wanted to talk to you about was Taylor versus Allidaire Limited, 1978. Now, some of the cases that we do look at are quite dated, but that's because they've 
um, set out a key principle that the courts still refer back to today. So just because it's quite an old case now doesn't mean it's not relevant. It is still hugely relevant. Taylor was a pilot. He landed a plane and he crashed it. Um, he caused pretty extensive damage to the plane. Thankfully, although the plane was damaged, no humans on the plane were damaged. Well, not, not significantly. He was dismissed for poor performance. And he said, that's not fair because it's the first time I've made this sort of mistake and I've never had a disciplinary warning. You've never said to me, you're not satisfied with my performance. I've made one mistake, one example of poor capability, and you've gone and dismissed me. Unfair. But the court said, no, that was a... Typically, we don't dismiss employees the first time they do something wrong. But employers are required and entitled to have regard to the severity of the impact of the mistake. This was hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of damage that the employee had done. Now, in some ways, you can sort of feel a little bit sorry for Taylor. Well, I can, I don't, I don't know whether you can, but I can. Um, I work at a university. If I make a mistake, and every so often I do make mistakes, of course I do, I'm human. If I make a mistake, it's not going to cost hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of damage. I can't think of anything I could do that could achieve that. And it's not going to, well, it's very unlikely to cause any harm to anyone. You know, let's just think of doctors. They can make a mistake and that can result in somebody dying. And some of us are in jobs where the consequences of our mistakes are just never as serious as other professions that we could think about. But that doesn't mean that it can't be fair to dismiss somebody that makes a serious mistake. We choose what careers we go into, we choose the jobs that we do, and therefore we have to take the consequences for the severity of, of what we might do that is wrong. So if there is one bad event and it has a really bad impact, and it doesn't necessarily have to be that somebody is really badly harmed, it could have very significant damage to your reputation, for example, something like that, then that one instance of underperformance could lead to a fair dismissal. Now, I've mentioned once or twice disciplinary warnings. Taylor is an exception to the rule, really, because the rule is that we don't go straight in and dismiss, but we warn an employee that their underperformance is not satisfactory. Let's go back to my example of that employee that everybody knows is a little bit of a disaster area. Have they ever been told? And it would be very interesting if we did share our anecdotes of people we know who constantly underperform. And I assure you, I am not going to ask you to be naming any employees like that. But if we did share those anecdotes, what would be really interesting is to go to those individuals and say, did you know your employer thinks you're an underperformer? Because there'll be quite a few of them that won't know. So our responsibility is to say to an employee, your performance is not good enough. And that really should start with an informal warning. So when we go to employees and say, right, I'm writing to you now and inviting you to a disciplinary meeting to discuss your poor performance, it's not a surprise. The employee should know that we're not satisfied. So the starting point is always that informal chat come on, this is not good enough. What's the problem? What are we going to do about it? 
But if that doesn't work, then we have to give at least two disciplinary warnings, <clears throat> excuse me, before we consider dismissing. <clears throat> and it has to be at least two because we have to follow the ACAS code of practice, disciplinary and grievance procedures. And the ACAS code sets out a minimum of two warnings and they are a formal written warning and a final written warning. And we give the first warning and we set targets for improvement for the employee. And if they don't improve, we then go to a final written warning. And if they don't improve, we then go to a dismissal. Now, the reality is that most employees who get a formal written warning, in my experience, and I have given out quite a, a good wodge of formal written warnings in my time, most employees do one of two things. They either leave because they think, well, this is never going to work out and they go and get another job or they improve. Because what you're saying to an employee is you're two steps away from dismissal and nobody wants to be dismissed. They might want to leave the organisation. They might dream of working somewhere else, but none of us want a dismissal on our record. And in all the many uh, disciplinary situations that I've managed, I can only think of two occasions, and I'm pretty certain there only are two occasions, although at my age your memory goes, um, but I can only think of two occasions where I have actually dismissed an employee following on from disciplinary warnings. Every other situation, they've either improved or they've gone. So Jackie asks a question and let's uh, take the question now. Does an employee have to sign something to say they've received the warning to stop an employee from making out such a letter was given in hindsight? Yeah, I mean, you are going to have to confirm in writing the disciplinary warning. Um, and it's always good to have a, a bit at the bottom of the letter that just says, please sign to say that you've received and understood this letter and then got it back. But you are also going to have a disciplinary meeting. You're going to have minutes of that meeting, as we'll talk about in a moment. So there is going to be no question that it all happened. And we'll talk about process in just a, a minute now. So you've given me a formal written warning and told me that my performance is not good enough. So does that mean then that I am under notice for the rest of my working career with that organisation? That if I slip up one more time, you can give me the next warning? No. So a warning has a life. And this is the period of time that it remains on the employee's record. For a formal written warning, it's six months. For a final written warning, it's 12 months. And if during that period of time, the employee does not make the required improvement, then you can go to the next level of warning. So we have a period of time in which the employee has got to make a sustained improvement. And once that warning's gone, then the employee's back to the beginning. And one of the really frustrating things about disciplinary warnings is you can give somebody a formal written warning for underperformance and they perform brilliantly. They're as good as gold for six months. The formal written warning comes to an end, six months and a day, and we're right back to the beginning. And all those poor habits that poor performance is happening all over again. You give another formal written warning. Six months, they're as good as gold. Six months and a day, we're back to the beginning. What can you do in those situations? Well, what you can do is you can say to an employee, right, last time, six months and a day, we were back to the beginning. So yeah, I'm going to have to start again at the beginning of the procedure at the formal written, but I'm putting you on notice that if your performance dramatically declines immediately following the expir exp expiration of the warning, then I am going to go straight to a final written warning. 
And as long as you've told the employee that's what you're going to do, then yes, you can do it. So it's your responsibility to train your employees. And if the employee is underperforming because you haven't trained them and then you go down the route of giving them a disciplinary warning, it will be an unfair dismissal if you get to the end of the process. And this was set out in the case of Steel Print Limited versus Haynes, 1995. Um, in this case, the uh, employee was actually recruited as an order clerk and spent most of her working time proofreading. She was then told that she was, uh, her job was changing in effect and it would involve a lot of touch typing and she got to reach a certain speed. She couldn't do it. She could do the proofreading, she could do the ordering, she was not quick on the old touch typing. And so targets kept being set, she didn't meet them. And then eventually, after a series of warnings, she was dismissed. That was an unfair dismissal because the employer didn't give her enough training. Yeah, they gave her a bit of support at the start, but they didn't actually send her off to be trained in doing the skill that they wanted. So you cannot penalise an employee if they don't have the skill, if you've changed the job and you've not given the training. Now, this case would have had a different outcome if Haynes had been told, right, your job has changed. The job of proofreading isn't needed anymore. It's now touch typing, sending you off on a training course. That was quite an adequate training course and you haven't met the standard. I'll send you off for a little bit more training, a little bit more training, and then she hadn't met the standard. Now that would have been different because the employer had done all it could do and the, the job had evolved and changed and new skills were needed. But you cannot rush to dismiss. And one of the things that um, I've definitely found in my HR career as you have line managers that come in and say, right, so-and-so is underperforming, how quickly can I dismiss? Totally the wrong question. So-and-so is underperforming, how quickly can we get support to this employee so that they are performing? And we should never be thinking about how quickly we can get to the end of the process, we should be thinking how we can make the process work so that we don't have to get to the end of it. And employment tribunals will be very critical of employers that are just rushing to dismissing. Um, lack of qualifications can lead to a fair dismissal. And that was shown in the case of Devon and Cornwall Police and the Crime Commissioner versus Weekend 2014. In this case, Weekin was a financial investigator employed by the police force, and he had a uh, qualification that was given accreditation by the National Policing Improvement Agency. He was a pretty poor performer, and his um, qualification was revoked because of the number of errors that he made he was no longer qualified as a financial investigator because the regulatory body had said, your performance means we're not giving you that badge. And he was dismissed because he didn't have the qualification and that was found to be a fair dismissal. So there is a point at which if an employee hasn't got the qualifications or they lose qualifications, you can say, that's the end of it. Now, with a disciplinary warning, what we have to do is we have to write to the employee and set out the allegation. And we have to send them evidence of that allegation, whatever we're relying on. We then hold a disciplinary meeting. We then allow them to appeal. Now, if we're going to move from one level of warning to the next, what we're basically saying is you haven't improved. So the things that 
the employee does to get warning one have got to be pretty much the same as warning two. So you can't give a formal written warning for poor attendance and then say, right, you're now underperforming, so we'll give you a final written warning, because those two things are not the same. So there's got to be a link. You've not improved, we're going to the next level. But don't box yourself into a corner so that you've worded a warning so narrowly and so specifically that you can't move to the next level when the employee continues to underperform. Let me explain that by telling you about the case of Jax versus BMI Baby 2011. In this case, Jax worked as cabin crew for the airline and she made some errors. She gave the wrong meals to passengers when they'd requested specific meals for a dietary or religious reasons. And of course, that potentially can be fatal if it's an allergy. Thankfully, it wasn't. And also, do you remember those, do you remember those days that we could go on aeroplanes? But do you remember how when you're taxiing out to the runway, the cabin crew, somebody from the cabin crew will say, welcome to this flight to Paris. And you're sitting back thinking, I'll soon be in Paris. She got the destination wrong a number of times. And so you're sitting back thinking, oh, I'm off to Paris. And the voice comes over, welcome to this flight to Rome. Rome? I'm not going to Rome for. And so she was given a disciplinary warning for behavior that could upset or endanger customers. And then um, you know how when the plane's taken off and um, everybody's got the seatbelts fastened and the signs still up, and then there's a, a sort of bing and the cabin crew start getting up and walking around the cabin before the seatbelt sign is off. What happens is that the pilot uh, communicates to the cabin crew, one, the cabin crew at the front of the plane, using the internal phone system to say it's safe for the cabin crew to get up. And then they inform the cabin crew that sat elsewhere in the aircraft by just doing some bings. And there's a certain number of bings that they do. And I, I'm not going to tell you how many it is in case I get it wrong, because there is another number of bings that means we're in an emergency. And I don't want to tell you the wrong number of bins or you'll be frightened every time you fly from now. Anyway, Jack's over binged. And so the cabin crew at the back of the plane took that as the emergency signal because that's what it was. And they start rushing down the aisle going brace, brace and everybody's bracing. There's huge panic and people are screaming. And Jax is given a final written warning for behavior that could upset or endanger customers. And then one day she gets to work and she hasn't got her identity card. So she can't work because she can't go airside. And who's got the card? Because we don't want the wrong people going airside at airports. This time she's dismissed for behavior that could upset or endanger customers. And she says, no, that's not fair because I did three different things wrong, got the meals and the destination wrong, I overbinged and I, I lost my card. She actually found it in her drive, it had fallen out of her bag. But that was found to be a fair dismissal because all of the things she'd done had endangered or upset customers or had had the potential to do so. So don't word your warnings so narrowly that you can't go to the next level but at the same time don't be ridiculously broad either. Now I said that a warning has a life and therefore if we're on to six months and a day the warning has expired we've got to go back to the beginning. But the case of Airbus UK Limited versus Web 2008 makes a very interesting point, but we do need to have a little bit of a health warning on, uh, on this case. Web had had a final written warning for insubordination and poor attitude. Uh, it had expired. And then he was caught during working hours watching television with a group of colleagues. The employer felt this is borderline gross misconduct, misconduct. If it was gross misconduct, we could go straight to dismissal without warnings. But was it really bad enough to dismiss? The other colleagues had never had any 
trouble before and they were all really sorry and you know, remorseful as to what they've done. They were all given final written warnings. And you can do that if your policy allows. If you're in one of those, should I dismiss, should I not borderline situations, you can go straight to a final written warning if your policy says that's an option. Webb, however, had got history of poor attitude and he was really quite rude to uh, the managers who were investigating this and he was dismissed. And he said, well, that's not fair because I hadn't got any live warnings. And the court said, no, 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 it is fair because when we decide what sanction is appropriate, we can have regard to the employee's attitude and behavior. Now, do be careful with this because it's not saying, hey, just ignore the life of a warning. But it is saying if you've got an employee who's just generally uh, um, underperforming consistently, you could potentially dismiss, presuming, of course, that they've been told before that what they're doing is not acceptable. And when we go to dismissal, we don't have to go back over the earlier warnings and check them out again and potentially hear yet another appeal about them. And this was said in the case of Davis versus Sandwell Metropolitan Borough Council 2013. Davis was a physics teacher. She was given a, a written warning for inappropriate behavior in the classroom. She was then given a final written warning for something very similar. And then she was dismissed again, for something very similar. And she said, well, the dismissal is unfair because my final written warning was unfair. But I didn't appeal that because I was worried that if I appealed it, it would be increased. So I've been given a final written warning. If it's increased, that's dismissal. So it's better just to keep my head down and accept it. But what the Court of Appeal said was, first of all, there is no requirement to go back over warnings that have already been given and to check that they're fair. Check they're there for all means, but, but not that they're fair. And secondly, when you hear an appeal, you can't increase the sanction. So if somebody appeals against a warning, the potential outcomes are that it stays as it is, or it's removed or it's reduced increasing a warning is never an option at an appeal stage. So Davis lost a claim. Now I did say at the beginning that I'd come back to health because it could be that the reason that the employee is underperforming is that they are poorly. And our first question is whether they are disabled as defined in the Equality Act 2010 because if they are disabled, there is a duty on the employer to make reasonable adjustments to help that employee to overcome any disadvantage experienced due to the disability. A disability is a physical or mental impairment. So it's important to note that we're not just thinking of physical disabilities. When we, when we think of disability, we often you know, think wheelchair, no, no, disability is broad. And mental health can lead to a disability in the same way that physical health has, can. It's a substantial and long-term adverse effect. That means it's lasted for 12 months. In medical opinion, it's going to last for 12 months or it's terminal. And it's had this adverse effect on the ability to do normal day-to-day -day activities. And they're not defined in law, but they're the things that we normally do. Talk, walk, speak, hear, lift, carry, um, bend, all those sorts of things. So it's the normal day-to-day -day activities. And also note that cancer, HIV and AIDS and multiple sclerosis are disabilities from the date of diagnose, diagnosis, regardless of the severity of their symptoms. We don't always know if somebody is disabled. Those last three, cancer, HIV, AIDS, and multiple sclerosis, in some ways are straightforward because if somebody is diagnosed, they are disabled. 
But if somebody has an illness that is having some impact on them, but we don't really know whether it's substantial, then what we need to do is get a medical opinion. And if there is an argument between the employer and the employee as, if, as to whether somebody is disabled, what will happen is that the employment tribunal will make the decision and they will have medical opinion that the employer will come along with, medical opinion that the individual will come along with, and they will make a decision based on what they hear. But if an employee is disabled, rather than saying oh, they're underperforming, let's rush along and get to the stage of dismissal, what we have to say is before we do anything else, what can we do differently about their job to help them? And we are talking reasonable adjustments. We are not talking of doing absolutely anything, regardless of the cost. And this was shown in the case of Cordell versus Foreign and Commonwealth Office 2011. Cordell is profoundly deaf and she worked for the FCO and applied for a new job that would involve her being placed overseas. She was successful. To work, she needed somebody who had hearing and who could sign to work alongside her. And this person would listen for her, would sign to her, she would sign back to the person and that person would then speak for her. To provide that person for the three years of the placement, along with the accommodation, the flights and all the other costs of posting people overseas was going to cost close to a million pounds. And the FCO said, no, that is not a reasonable adjustment. And Cordell said, you're a big employer. It is a reasonable adjustment. But the court said, no, that was too big. So if an employee is disabled, we make reasonable adjustments. We don't have to do anything. We have regard to the size and resource of the business. So the expectation on a small business is smaller than an ex expectation on a large corporation. And it is the employer who has the responsibility for identifying the reasonable adjustment. Yes, you can ask the employee, what would help you? But if the employee says, I don't know, it is the employer's duty to work it out. And a tip, um, not an employment law point, but a tip is go and talk to a charity, if there is one, that deals with the particular disability that the individual has, because those charities are advising people all the time and they often have some really, really good advice to give. So it's definitely worth um, going and having a chat with them. Now, what if an employee is underperforming and it is a health issue and you're told that if you continue to employ them in the job, the same problem is going to occur. Well, this was a question in DB Schenker Rail UK Limited versus Doolin 2011. Doolin worked as an operations manager on the railway. He was in a safety critical role and he found it stressful. He was struggling with the job and eventually he went off sick. And whilst he was off sick because he wasn't doing the job, he started to get better. And then he said he was ready to return. So the employer referred him to occupational health. He said, yeah, he's ready to come back. But if you give him back his old job, give it a few months, we'll be back to where we are. And so Schenker Rail said, right, OK, you can come back, but not to that job. And they offered him a number of roles at the same grade, same status, same salary, same terms and conditions, but different jobs. And he said, no, don't want them. I want my old job back. And they said, no, we can't do that because we're just going to be back at the beginning in a short period of time. He refused, he refused, and eventually um, he was dismissed. And that was found to be a fair dismissal. If an employee can't do a job, we have a duty to help them. 
if there's a good reason why they're never going to be able to do the job, we have a duty to think, is there anything else we can give them to do? But ultimately, we don't have to keep with an employee who, who won't accept our help. And then how long do we wait for an employee to get better or to improve? In the case of BS versus Dundee City Council 2013, the employee had been off sick for a year and the employer was starting to say, well, I think we need to call this to an end and referred the employee to occupational health who said, well, he will be well enough to come back to work, but maybe in a month, maybe in three months, maybe a different length of time, but we think eventually he will be okay to come back. And the council said, well, no, we can't wait forever and we need certainty. And so they dismissed him. And that was found to be fair. If there is no end in sight, then yes, you can say enough is enough. They waited a year. That isn't necessarily the right length of time. It might be that it's a shorter period, particularly for smaller businesses where one person being off sick can be a significant percentage of the employees that are absent. So it's all about being reasonable. Now, I'm going to ask if there are any questions in our last few minutes together, but some key messages. You manage underperformance. It is a management issue that management have the authority and the power to address. And you can dismiss, but you shouldn't rush to dismiss. But if you are a manager of people, you know who your underperformers are and you know who your good performers are. Deal with it. And there is no reason at all that you cannot deal with it. Use disciplinary warnings if it is needed. Hopefully, a friendly chat will steer the employee back on the right path. But if it doesn't, then show your intent. And disciplinary warnings can be quite motivating to the other employees as well. And that might seem a really odd thing to say. But if you're working really, really hard and you're doing a really good job and you see another employee paid the same as you, getting away with doing very little, that's demotivating. So actually, it can be motivating for the other employees if you do something about it. Don't forget about health because there are employees who, who just go through a really bad patch and it could be physical health, it could be mental health, it could be some really difficult personal circumstances that employees are dealing with. So, you know, let's be reasonable. But ultimately, you don't have to accept poor performance. Now, I can see I've got a very long question here and I've got to take my glasses off to see it. So you had two employees who didn't declare their long term health issues. Chef suffered from epilepsy and his memory was deteriorating. One day he works brilliantly. The next day he appears intoxicated on drugs and performs really poorly. After four months, I'd had enough and asked why. He then confided about his epilepsy. For, uh, for his safety, you have to dismiss, dismiss, but you were made feel evil by the rest of the employees. And they started to show attitude, making job, my job as a boss difficult and uncomfortable. Eventually, they left voluntarily. The second employee didn't declare her OCD. She struggled to follow instructions from day one. I thought she just needed time to settle in. Five months later, I finally put her on performance notice and then she confided her mental health. You're not a bad employer, not able, but you feel that you're not able to manage people, you lose confidence. Yeah, you know, it is tricky um, because there are employees who are downright difficult and there are employees who are really struggling with, difficult circumstances as well. Be consistent, be fair, be reasonable and communicate. So this is why I'm making this decision. You say it's, it's a small business. So we're a small business. 
and one employee underperforming has a real impact in a way that in a large business, it doesn't have quite the same impact. So as long as you are fair and reasonable and consistent, yeah, there will be rocky times. And when you give a disciplinary warning to somebody, others might think it's really unfair. You're managing it. You do not have to tolerate underperformance. And even with employees that are um, ill and maybe even have a disability, you've got to make reasonable adjustments, but you've also got a business to run. And so if there are no reasonable adjustments that can be made, sometimes you do have to take some tough decisions, but just be fair, reasonable, consistent. And eventually employees will come to respect that. Um, would the process be shorter if the employee was incapable as a result of qualifications? Potentially, it depends what the impact of not having those qualifications is. So, for example, um, I say my background is in HR. So having um, membership fellowship of the Chartered Institute of Personnel and Development is good for HR people. But you can operate as an HR person without membership of the CIPD. So to dismiss somebody because they didn't get CIPD membership is probably going to be difficult because it's not a requirement of the job. But um, if, for example, you're a doctor and you get struck off the medical register, then legally you cannot practice. And therefore, yes, it would be shorter because what you'd be saying is, I can't employ you as a doctor. If I do so, I will be breaking the law. So it really does depend on the qualification and the impact of it. Um, I want to ask all potential applications to declare health issues. Um, well, you can't ask somebody about health questions before you employ them unless having a particular health issue would simply mean they couldn't do the job. So, for example, if you were a scaffolding company and you wanted to know that somebody could work at heights, then you can ask them that question. Also, you can ask if you are saying that you want an individual to have experience of a particular health problem to be able to do the job. So for example, if you've got somebody working as a counselor and you say that you want them to have experience of mental health problems, that's an ACAS example. I'm not personally convinced by it, um, but you cannot just ask general health questions because why are you asking because if they say, yes, I've got a disability, I don't want to employ you. You can't do that. That's disability discrimination. So you can only ask health questions if you've got a really good reason for asking them. And um, having had a bad experience in the past with somebody with a particular illness would not allow you to ask that question. So do not ask health questions at the interview or the assessment stage, because if you did then reject somebody, they would think that was the reason, even if it wasn't. So no, you can't ask those questions. Um, is there a different procedure if a person is on a long freelance contract? Totally depends if they're an employee. And unfortunately, we don't have time today to go through the rather complex maze of understanding employment status. If they are an employee and they're on a fixed term contract and you want to end the fixed term contract early due to underperformance, it's the same process. If they're actually a self-employed contractor working as a freelancer, then you don't have to go through this process at all. You, you would simply give notice that you were terminating the arrangement. What's stopping all employers from writing policies that mean everyone goes to a later stage in the process without a verbal or an informal warning? Yeah, okay. So most employers do have a policy that says you can go to the final written warning, but only when we're into those borderline, is it dismissal, is it not dismissal um, questions. You can't have a policy that says you will always go straight there. 
because if you did that, in effect, as, as the question suggests, you're just saying there'll be one warning before dismissal and that would breach the ACAS Code of Practice disciplinary and grievance procedures. So it's only in those really borderline, shall I dismiss, shall I not situations that you could do that. With remote working, I don't think everyone declares their health background as they're not surrounded by their colleagues and it's easy to hide. Should they declare them and what are the implications if they don't? They don't have to declare them unless there is a reason that due to the work they're doing, they've got to um, from a, a, a legal perspective. So, for example, if they're going to be doing some driving and they suffer from epilepsy and therefore they're not allowed to drive. I'm talking that sort of situation, but an employee, whether they're remote working or they're working in, in the workplace, does not have to declare a health issue and you can't insist that they do. If they don't and then they underperform and you terminate their employment because they've underperformed, then they wouldn't be able to say, well, that was disability discrimination unless they could show that you should have realized that they had a disability. And that's quite difficult to show really. But you cannot say to employees, right, everybody, you've got to declare all your health conditions. You can't do that. Thank right, so it is 1.30, so we've come to an end. Thank you so